first of October of 2020. So happy October, everybody. Uh, glad to see everyone here with us uh, this month. Uh, the reason I am greeting you is because our president, Cindy Moffitt, is on the road today and will be unable to join us. Uh, my name, as you can see, is Stuart Harris. I have the exalted title of vice president, which means I don't really do anything except when Cindy's gone. <laughs> Uh, and it's actually a position I rather like in that regard, except for the fact that she is gone today, and so I'm in the unfortunate position of having to do something. Uh, what I'm going to do is introduce today's program, and today's program uh, has to do with our very good friend, Jeanette Brown, and with her journey to publication. Now, she's talking about this particular book, The Illusion of Leaving, uh, which I purchased uh, right in front of the Union Avenue bookstore when she had her, her grand opening, uh, her her launch party uh, out in front of the bookstore uh, a couple of months ago. I must say that this was not merely a duty purchase. This was something I looked forward to. And uh, then when I read it, I enjoyed it immensely. Uh, it was a very, very pleasant book. It's a very compelling book that has a very interesting plot and very interesting characters. Uh, perhaps some insight even into Jeanette's own past because it's based on a lot of her experiences uh, growing up in Texas. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Jeanette. She has published short stories in respected journals for decades. Uh, but of course, like most of us, landing a publishing house for a first novel was another story. Uh, she kept on it. She kept on at it. And uh, until The Illusion of Leaving was published by the Texas Review Press uh, this past May in 2020. She uh, has been published uh, prior to this uh, in the Bellevue Literary Review, the Southwestern American Literature, New Millennium Writings, Steel Toe Review, and other publications. Uh, she's the co-editor of Literary Lunch, uh, a, a KWG food anthology. And this is the part that intrigues me. She's enjoyed residencies at the Sewanee Writers Conference, the Rivendell Writers Colony, and I, I've always wondered if that involves elves, um, and Hedgebrook, India. And um, so I want to hear all about her journey and how she got from idea to novel to publication. And that's apparently what we're going to hear about today. So without further ado, Jeanette, would you like to tell us all about your journey to publication? Yes. yes. First of all, I'll tell you, can you hear me? Is it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to tell you what the book is about. Jamie Wright hates her West Texas hometown of Silver Falls but with her father, Big Jim, on his deathbed, she returns to plan his funeral. With the help of old friends, the community, and the pool of the land where she was raised, Jamie comes to terms with grudges, guilt, and secrets long past what should have been their expiration date. I'll read a little bit of this uh, later. And while I'm reading, if you have any questions, you can post them to the chat room, and then we'll have a question and answer period. Um, most of us submit poems and short stories to various journals and we forget about it and about four months later we get either a rejection or an acceptance and we go, yeah, I forgot I, I, forgot I submitted that. And that's what happened to me um, with this book. Um, I had shopped it around to various places, not, not really seriously. And Mercer College, I think it's in South Carolina, the guy there that, at the press just loved it. He said, I don't know what to do with it because he has an Eastern, Southeastern marketing situation. And he said, if you can rewrite this and set it in the South, I can, I can do something with it. And I was like, I... I don't know how to do that. So what I did was um, look, the book is set in Texas. So I looked at Texas presses and Texas University, Texas Review Press, I think it's part of Sam Houston State University. They have um, an annual contest and I was a little over, they had a word limit. I was a little bit over that. So I didn't think I could do it, but the next year I went ahead and um, submitted it for the contest and forgot about it. So um, I was real surprised when I got a phone call that said, you came in second in the George Garrett um, contest. So um, it was second place, but at that time, second place K 
came with a contract for publication. No advance on either first place or second place, but publication, that's what we're, that's what I was after. So um, there, the contest is open again. So if you have a novel or um, if you have anyone, any friends who are trying to get published, the contest is the George Garrett Prize. Um, the deadline is actually December 31st. You can go to uh, texasreviewpress.org and they'll tell you the word limits and uh, um, there's um, a, a, a fee involved. It's not very much, so. Anyway, they're real good people, so I recommend them. Um, before I submitted it, I had a started writing this in 2013. So therefore I have had a lot of time to workshop it. I've workshopped the whole novel with a group. Um, we were all online in various places around the US and I had workshopped the first chapter in various workshops. And the first chapter was actually published as a short story um, in a journal in Fort Worth, Texas, Christian University's publication. Um, so with the second place, I've got a contract, no advance. It's paperback and the press run was 350 copies. They've changed the rules um, on the contest now. Um, there's no second place, but first place comes with a $1,000 um, advance and publication. So I guess that's an improvement. It gets a little more publicity, comes with money. There are uh, places that won't publicize um, contests public for, for novels that don't come with money. So it's good for the press and for the winning author. Um, university presses and small presses do a bit of marketing and I should back up and say, they will ask you, any publisher will ask you for a marketing plan. And this is like eight pages of um, what organizations are you a member of? Because each organization is publicity and potential sales. They ask you um, who the local reviewers are, local people that are influenced that, that would like a book. Um, so you just, have to, uh, what, what awards do you think this book would be um, up for? Like it's debut novel, so you'd research what awards are available for debut, debut novels. Um, and so you fill out that marketing plan and based on that, the presses will usually send out galleys to their normal uh, places and also to the places you list. Now, I didn't have any warning that this was happening. And I was talking to Alan Sims, who does the Urban Guide newsletter for downtown. And he was going like, I really liked your book. And it was like, it's just like, I don't know, February? It's like, what are you doing with my book? I've forgotten that I listed him as somebody local that would, you know, talk about the book. And he did, he did a, a great interview. Um, so, and I was in charge of getting my own blurbs too. That was kind of a surprise. Um, I asked the guy who wrote Urban Cowboy. Is that right? Yeah, Urban Cowboy. He's from Spur, Texas, where I am from. And he agreed to blurb and then he disappeared. So I don't know if he got sick or if he didn't like the book. But anyway, that was kind of a disappointment to me because that was the one famous person that, that I knew. Um, my efforts included buying some um, publicity, some reviews, and some other publicity from the Lone Star Literary Review, which is kind of a big deal in Texas. They, they tie together a bunch of blogs, and um, back when you could still tour, they would publicize your tour. They will review the book. There's, um, they do a variety of things, but of course, all that comes with a little fee. Everything you see about books usually comes 
has been paid for either by the publisher or the author. So um, left to my own devices, I organized a six stop tour of book bookstores in Texas. And it was Houston, Austin, San Antonio, Dallas, Lubbock. So I was gonna have a good time and this was gonna be, I had a March, no, I had a May 1 launch date. You know what happened in March. So I, um, part of my publicity, I just told you, um, Big Jim is on his deathbed. And so part of the book is his funeral. So I ordered funeral fans as my thing instead of a tote bag or something else that would um, be publicity people would carry around. So um, there I was with <laughs> a, a lot of um, funeral fans, but um, the bookstores, they managed to disperse them. So I thought it was, I still think it's funny. <laughs> um, and so I didn't get my launch. I was gonna have a big wine and cheese do at Union Avenue because before the pandemic, I worked there. And so they were gonna give me a big party. And um, then we couldn't do that after COVID hit. So I devised a drive-by launch party and um, we just had a great time. Flossie um, organized a um, play, what do you call it? A play, the music. She had a music from Texas that was blaring out on the sidewalk and we had walk-ups and drive-bys. And at that point, we'd been under siege for about two months and people were really uh, pleased to have a destination besides the grocery store. So they, they took their time and we all laughed and chatted and I signed books and it was fun. Um, the, the photo that you saw with the um, notice of tonight's reading um, was of that day and I just looked so happy because I was. <laughs> it was a good time. Um, in addition to what I was um, doing on my own, I, I, of course, was not the only person, only author whose launch got torpedoed. And somehow I uh, became involved with a group of about a dozen women whose books um, did not get the proper launch. And so we agreed to buy each other's books and review them on um, Goodreads and Amazon and tout them on our um, social media too. So that has worked out pretty well and I, I really feel good about that. Plus there was, there's an author, um, Johnny Bernhardt, who is, um, she's just public, her third book got torpedoed, her launch. She had, I don't know, 25 stops on her tour and that all got washed away. And so um, she's a, Texas Review Press publisher, um, author too. And so she's been very helpful. I'm, I've been really grateful for all the back and forth and the support of other authors who are in the same situation. Um, if you are interested in publication or you know anybody who is, I highly recommend this book. They have it at Union Ave Books. Or, and if they're out, they can order it. It'll be there in two or three days. But it's before and after the book deal. A Writer's Guide to Finishing, Publishing, Promoting, and Surviving. And as you can tell, it was very useful to me. <laughs> so um, I recommend that book. It's, it's, um, it was published in the spring, so all the information is fairly new, except it, of course, it doesn't, didn't uh, know about the pandemic. So you can work around that. Um, and I would recommend also, if you're looking for a publisher, we have two fine local publishers. One is Celtic Cat and Laura still is the owner of that. And she publishes local people, um, what, just fiction, poetry, horror, guidebooks, whatever, whatever suits her fancy. Yeah. And she has been the president of the guild for several years. So she, the Celtic Cat supports 
the Knoxville Writers Guild. The other uh, press is Iris Press. They mostly do poetry, but they've done novels. Um, so it, it's worth a try. Um, and they too support the Knoxville Writers Guild and both of these presses support um, your local independent bookstore, Union Avenue. So um, I'm gonna read a little bit from the book and then we'll do question and answer. Um, set this up. Big Jim has indeed died. And um, Jamie, his only child, who's like in her 60s or more, um, she has been to the reading of the will and found some terribly distressing news about the will and what she thought all of her life. She, um, just out of high school, she married Brady Joe and then they divorced and Brady Joe was kind of like a son to Big Jim. So there was some shocking news at the, at the reading of the will, but now she's decided to be, um, you know, gracious and go to the, I, I don't know what we call it, in spur, it's the, the supper after the funeral. You feed the family because they're obviously too distraught to cook. So this is in the Methodist church. Aromas of cinnamon and yeast fill the hall of the Silver Falls First Methodist Church. The murmuring voices momentarily stop when Jamie passes under the plaque, dedicating the rec room to its donor, her mother, Dolores Spivey Wright. The voices resume as she spots the pink-haired Wanda waving her over to a counter crowded with Tupperware bowls. Your days of hamburgers, and pizzas are over. We've got meatloaf and King Ranch casserole and rump roast, mac and cheese, sweet corn, yeast rolls, cornbread, light bread, you name it. Jamie wants to be hungry, wants to be polite and eat something from each of the dozens of options. But her stomach is in turmoil, turmoil as is her brain. She tries to ignore the food, trying to take in the blandness of the room. When Dolores designed and funded this wing of the church, she had decorated it in pale Italianate yellows and blues. She imported tropical plants, palms and such, real ones, which the church ladies allowed to die. Now the room, floor, ceiling and walls has been painted beige by Methodist women with a more conventional taste in decor. And there remains not a plant, bookcase, framed print or rug to suck up the bouncing echoes of voices and the shuffling of metal chairs. Miss Burns, Jamie's fourth grade teacher, waves a decrepit little claw in Jamie's direction before she falls back to her feeble feeding. Jamie makes her way between the diners to give Miss Burns a gentle hug and notices Mr. Wilkerson, the retired civics teacher wrestling coach, sitting next to her. Jamie would have sworn they were both long deceased Yet here they are, ghosts of her past, but not the hectoring kind. Um, after patting and tapping and otherwise acknowledging Silver Falls ancients, Jamie makes her way back to the food table. She glances around the room again, taking in the frizzy gray perms and bald heads, the flabby upper arms and the stooped shoulders. She understands that too soon, she will be gray and flabby. Always the outsider for a moment, she feels a quiet kinship with the people of Silver Falls. Big Jim's people and hers too. Now she's wolfish, filling a plate with every possibility, letting the potato salad touch the yam casserole and the tuna salad, if that's what that is, although it appears to be mostly mayonnaise. Yeast rolls and cornbread both with butter, she intends to eat her way through grief and anger. Jamie takes a seat beside Wanda and across from Gina, trusting that, that Gina is over this afternoon's swivet at the barbecue place. Gina reminds her of a mongrel dog, never knowing whether it will bite her hand or lick it. She settles her paper plate and plastic utensils on the red and white 
paper tablecloth, probably left over from the annual Valentine's banquet. From her vantage, she sees Donna helping Pearl to a chair. The young girl reminds her of someone she can't place, but she lets it go, distracted by Pearl's loud voice. I told Big Jim, Big Jim, you don't know beans. Pearl quiets when Donna gives her a couple of elbow jabs. We're fortunate my mother didn't get to finish that sentence, which reminds me, Wanda says between bites. Jamie, why was Mama invited to the will reading? I would ask her, but she'd shout it to the whole room. Maybe it's another Silver Falls secret. Jamie, trying not to talk with her mouth full, doesn't answer right away. She savors the forgotten, forbidden flavors. Vigorously salted, abundantly sugared, lard-based, and boosted with cream of mushroom soup. She slowly chews, swallows, and takes a sip of water. Wanda, it seems that Pearl and Big Jim made a $10,000 bet on which one of them would live the longest. She won. Wow, Mama's rich. Wanda clasps her hands together, but I'll have to ride her on her so she doesn't spend it all at the dollar store. Thank goodness she didn't lose her. I'd have to teach another decade to pay off Big Jim. Any other surprises at the reading? Jamie pauses to consider going back for seconds of that brown sugar jam dish, but decides against it. I guess it will all be public in about five minutes anyway. Big Jim gave some acreage to Dwayne and some to Brady Joe, along with livestock and a lump sum of cash for each. He gave my girls and Brady Joe's kids cash. Wanda looks as if she's thinking hard, maybe calculating the number of kids involved. And wow, yes, the big surprise is that Big Jim owned a condo in Santa Fe. Did you know about that, Jamie asked. Wanda nods her head. Word around town had it as a penthouse in Albuquerque. So good for you and your new condo, I'll come visit. Not so fast. Remember the platinum bond, blonde? She got the condo. It seems that she and daddy were paramours. I thought she'd be here. Jamie takes another close look around the room. She spots Digger and Dwayne in a far corner concentrating on their food. They both look as if this is their last supper. Dwayne's wife was at the funeral service, but she left before Jamie had a chance to say anything more than thank you. Jamie's been around Digger over the last two days, but only now does she recall the overheard conversation at the nail salon. Is Digger's wife named Thelma Lou? She was, maybe still is. Wanda lowers her voice a bit. She ran off with a propane man. Rumor has it they're down on the coast trolling for shrimp. Can't be much of a living. How old is she? Jamie, don't you remember Miss Silver Falls High of 1964? Thelma Lou was two years ahead of us, too old to be making a fool of herself like this. How's Digger doing? Wanda shrugs. He doesn't seem too unhappy. Maybe he's glad to be rid of her. Jamie looks around the room without focusing on anything or anybody. Even with her marital history, she's still amazed at the ease with which people come and go from each other's lives. Sometimes people disappear without leaving a trace, but others cleave deep notches that never heal. Speaking of, Brady Joe isn't here, but that's just as well for everyone. Where's Donald, didn't he come? No, the funeral took it out of him. I'll take a plate if there's anything. When the room goes quiet again, Jamie looks up to see Brady Joe in the doorway. Nervy bastard. He stands serenely scanning the room until he settles on Jamie. She looks down at her plate and stirs green beans into beet salad. Wanda, whatever happened to Linda Smith? Wanda keeps up the charade. Which one? There were two, remember? The one with the dark hair? She had a horse named Giddy Up or something. It takes a minute, but Wanda retrieves the information. The oldest memories come fastest and clearest. The horse was Gabby, Gabby Hayes. That Linda Smith was a rodeo star for years, a barrel racing queen. When she retired, she had a mess of first place belt buckles and tiaras and two pins in her left leg. She lives outside of San Antonio. Are we through ignoring him? Brady Joe makes his way between tables. People watch, waiting, except for Pearl with her back door telling another story in her too loud voice. Jamie watches Brady Joe come toward her in what seems like slow motion. 
She has time to develop a snappy, snarky remark, but she can think of nothing to say to this trickster, feels only the juvenile urge to pelt him with yeast rolls. On the other hand, maybe he's coming for Gina, but no. Brady Jo leans across the table. Wanda, you and I have to talk. Right now, can't you see I'm eating? Wanda looks uneasy. His voice is flat but insistent. Now. Wanda rises and follows him into the foyer. Gina watches them leave. That's what he said to me last night. That's what he said to me at the funeral. Jamie shakes her head, thinking that he probably has some lame explanation about the ranch lease gift, gift situation that she's avoided by fleeing from the will, will reading. You think that's his pickup line, that he uses it on cashiers at the grocery and the clerks at the feed store? Gina turns to see whether Jamie will laugh. He's one of those bad boys. They don't need pickup lines. Jamie tries to send death rays into Brady Joe's back. Actually, he's too old to have a pickup line. That old fart needs to stay home and count his cows. Still, Gina says, I wonder what they're talking about. She points, point, points to a roll on Jamie's plate. Are you gonna eat that? Without waiting for an answer, Gina palms the roll. Maybe you and I should join them in the hall and let him get talked out all at once. Jamie offers Gina a piece of cornbread. They both live here, so it could be anything. It's probably something civic or political or religious. Is Brady Joe a Methodist? You'd be the one to know, Gina says. There it is again, the iciness in her voice. Could she still be upset about something that happened over 40 years ago? Tell me about your job, Jamie says, hoping to find a safe topic. Gina uses a roll to swap the last of the spaghetti sauce from her paper plate. I design and illustrate books, mostly children's books. My husband writes them. I don't remember you being artistic in high school. Gina shoves her plate out of the way and pulls another plate, piled with desserts, closer. That's because Silver Falls didn't offer art classes. I took private classes with Henry Johns for years. Henry Johns, the name's vaguely familiar, the sign painter. Few people knew he was accomplished artist. Those, um, again, Jane, well, <laughs> Pearl and some of the other women begin picking up the empty plates and tidying up the buffet table, matching Tupperware tops to the shape of the bowls, some of which still hold enough for a husband's supper. When Gina goes for seconds of banana pudding, Jamie swipes the brownie from her plate and wonders who made the green bean casserole that keeps repeating on her. If she were a selfish twit instead of a responsible adult, she would get in her car and drive straight to Dallas. Instead, she'll change clothes before she and Wanda drive out to Big Jim's rest stop, a concept she continues to find hilarious. Finally, Wanda returns, pale and shaken. What, what did he want, Gina asked. It looks like he delivered some bad news. Are you okay? Jamie offers Wanda her glass of water. Jamie drifts into her chair, waving away the water and their concerns. Nothing. It's nothing. I'll just sit here a minute. She searches the room until she sees Pearl, then she looks away. I need to catch my breath. Do you still want to go driving around? Jamie asks, hoping Wanda will spill the secret when it's just the two of them in a car. We could see the ghost lights after you show me the rest stop. Gina stands to gather her plates, glass, and fork. That sounds like fun. What time? Caught by surprise, Jamie sees the shape of the evening shift from intimate girlfriend time into a guarded watch my back session. Here, Gina, she hands over a napkin. You have spaghetti sauce on your cheek. So now we can ask and answer questions. Well, that was absolutely wonderful, Jeanette. Uh, <laughs> what, what a wonderful excerpt. It reminded me, of course, when I read those words myself, and moreover, uh, <clears throat> I'm now very hungry. <laughs> Having heard that description of all of those wonderful dishes, um, I can't even decide which one of them might be my favorite. I simply noticed that there were so many carbohydrates that I think we'd all be in a coma right now uh, had we participated. Right, uh, salt and carbs. We already have a couple of questions on the chat function, but I'll go ahead and open things up. Okay. Um, I know very much how uh, Knoxville, Writersville, uh, Knoxville Writers Group 
a guild, excuse me, Knoxville Writers Guild, that's our organization, how a, how a group works within that, because you and I are in a writer's group together and yeah. we share we share pages every month and we critique one another's work and that's extremely helpful. And I encourage anyone who's uh, uh, with us tonight to think about joining such a group or forming such a group. It's maybe the core of, of what we do. <clears throat> but you also mentioned um, something called a workshop. How does a workshop differ from a writing group? A workshop is, well, it costs a lot of money for one thing. Okay. Um, and it's usually, um, if you do it online, it's usually say six weeks. Um, once a week. Um, if it's a conference or something like like that, it might be concentrated in the good old days over a long weekend or a week. Um, and it's different because you don't, you just get 20 pages of, of someone's writing and you don't know anything about them or how the story came about. There's no reference points to it. Um, like our group, spends the first probably 15 minutes <laughs> there's only there's five of us and we spend a little time um at the beginning of each monthly workshop um how are you what's happened you know we know each other's relatives and business and uh life situations we've been in, in each other's homes so um we're real familiar with the writing and how it got that way um the ones that are online or away from town, um, sometimes it's good because you just get, you know, these piece pages, 20 pages maybe, and that's all you have to work with. So that can be good too. But all the ways it's theoretically people telling you how to improve your work. Either you weren't clear about something or you could expand something some portion of it or what it's usually pretty helpful except when it's not um i workshop the first uh, chapters chapter of this book and i would get conflicting um opinions like nothing happens in the first chapter or too much you know it's like it depends um on what other people write if they're writing um horror or suspense or something they're they're not going to be content with a quiet first chapter um of a book that's character driven so that's my story very interesting um we have a couple of questions from debbie actually several so i'll have to pick one here that i think most people will find uh, compelling uh you referenced a press in south carolina that uh, liked your work, but uh, didn't know what to do with it. And so Debbie asks, uh, besides the location of the book, was there anything else they wanted you to change? Um, Mercer, no, that was, that was everything. <laughs> it was everything because although Texas can be pretty Southern about their funerals and their, their dinners for the family and some of those rituals, um, I can't write South Carolina's rituals like I could Texas because I live Texas. Now, if I wanted to research South Carolina's rituals, I would get to go there and visit and talk to people and read about it. So that's a whole different thing. And since I had the book all, already written, um, I didn't want to start over with it. So I thought regional publishers uh, from around Texas would would be more um, accepting of the book the way it was. Yeah, this is a very Texas book. I must absolutely say that, a very <laughs> Texas book. Uh, from our fellow writing group member, Marilyn, she said, did you only submit to the South Carolina publisher and the contest? I've been trying to remember because this is, you know, a seven year old process. Um, I probably approached some um, agents um, at various conferences, you know, um, there's two in Texas and there's one in Georgia where you can meet with agents and either give them your two sentence elevator pitch 
or submit something in writing. And um, I think those, I think Mercer and Texas Review Press are really the only um, presses that I, that I've contacted. A lot of university presses don't, uh, don't publish fiction and they are usually more interested in, in things either in their state or their region. So that's one thing to read around about and to research it. Understood. Um, I'm curious. Well, actually, no, I'm, I'm very curious about many things, but <laughs> let's go ahead and throw it open. Is there anyone now who would like to unmute himself or herself and uh, ask uh, Jeanette a question directly? I'll just make a comment. I think the book's Texas setting is excellent. And just one, it just oozes out of the book. And I can't imagine it being set anywhere else. So it was fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. I certainly tend to agree with Marilyn on that. This was a very Texas book. <laughs> is there I anyone? Know. Is there anyone actually, else? Uh, that question that you read about things that they wanted you to change, it wasn't just about that uh, South Carolina one or whatever. It was about, in general, if your publisher says, hey, I want you to change this, how do you stand your ground? How do you find what you will do? Um, I'm not sure because I wasn't asked to change anything. They just took it the way it was. Um, probably maybe because it was second in the contest and they thought, you know, if it was good enough, I don't know how many contestants they had, how many submissions, but um, um, never, even with my short stories, I've never really been asked to, to change anything. Does that include editing? Yeah. Um, no, no, they did a, they did a, a line edit. But it was mostly like, where does the exit mark on Estelotter go? It's, it was like consistency and correctness. It wasn't changing the way I said right. anything. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just uh, clarify that, if I can, as yes. a publisher. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, line edit is different from actual editing, which I think is what Debbie is trying to get at. Uh, lots of times, editing, line editing. Yeah, if if your publisher is asking for you to change something major, uh, basically it's because your storyline or your your plot line is not coming together properly, or there's some sort of problem like a weak ending, or the characters aren't well drawn. Really, those things are things that you should work out before you submit. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> seriously, uh, if you workshop like like Jeanette, you know, had this thing workshop. This was not her first draft that she sent in, mm -hmm. and you need to really workshop this and work and work with your writing group or who are your you know whoever you're working with to, uh, for commenting. And it can't be your family. I'm sorry, they don't count. Not to your publisher, <laughs> they do not count. Uh, so don't don't do this with somebody like you know if you can you have an old English teacher yeah I'll take her comment she knows what she's talking about but uh, you know you really need to talk with someone who knows what they're doing about and it depends on the publisher you know they may some publishers don't do a lot of this kind of editing a lot of times they will recommend that you hire a professional editor and I have done that I have recommended Bonnie Millard <laughs> to several people. <laughs> Uh, because she can help them work out their storyline and see where their things aren't gelling cor correctly. But, uh, you know, lots of times I'll do that as a publisher. I'll say, well, you need to do this, this, and this before you resubmit this. So getting your manuscript ready for publication is a whole big process. And publishing it is totally different from getting it ready for publishing. <laughs> yeah. All right. Is there anyone else who has another question? Come on, folks. Nothing to be afraid of. I'll, I'll answer We're all friends here. About, I will answer this one about the book tour. I call, um, I researched. Every bookstore has um, an online presence. They have, you know, their 
place you can order books and it tells you a map to their store and what they sell uh, when they have back in the good old days when they have a uh, book club that clubs that meet and whether or not you can join them so i would just go to their website and find out um start with a phone number and call and ask who does their events management and it's usually not the store manager and you don't call and say i want to speak to the store manager because they think you have a complaint and you might your call might get lost <laughs> so um just just start there the i knew the cities i wanted to go to and um there was uh, Lone Star Literary Review, which I bought publicity with, they have good resources and they had a list of bookstores by city in Texas. And, you know, Houston, um, you can get five bookstores, but one of them does, just does mysteries and one of them is not open on Sunday. And that's when it starts getting interesting of like, how long a drive is it between Dallas and Lubbock or San Antonio and Austin? So you, you plan your own tour, but you do it um, all online. All the information is there. And then you call, you find out who the events manager is and you call and say, do you have any opening? You know, you explain yourself. And what I had to do was the first sentence I had to say was, my book is being published by Texas Review Press because I was calling and not my publisher. It seemed like they would think I was um, self-published. And some people, some bookstores don't want to deal with that. So that was the first thing I would say, you know, I'm published by Texas Review Press. The book comes out, I will be in Houston this week sometime do you have any openings for reading or signing or whatever and then it just grew from there like I would be geographically was the main thing after that and they wanted review copies or galleys so they could get a leg up on the publicity and they wanted to know how many people do you think you can bring to this reading and uh, book people in Austin wanted me to assure them that I could bring about 50, at least 50 people to the reading. And I had lived in Austin, I've had a theater in Austin. I still had friends in Austin, so I thought I could probably pull that off, but I didn't know anybody in San Antonio. They were less stringent about what I could do for them. So anyway, it was a lot of fun. Um, Parnassus and Nashville, I never heard back from. Oxford Books in um, Oxford, <laughs> where is it? Um, I didn't plan my Tennessee tour because I was getting around to that. Um, I did have a reading scheduled for Asheville, um, Malprop's books, um, but the, the virus hit before I, got through the Texas tour plan. I mean, the Tennessee tour plan. So it's doable. All right. Are there any other questions from the peanut gallery? Well, I have a question. Oh, go ahead, please, please. Yes. Um, so one thing I liked about the book is the older protagonist. I'd like to see a, a new genre of books. <laughs> that I think it, I think it's a genre that could do well because there's so many people our age who are still reading and that sort of thing and want to read about somebody who's not young and 20 and in a bikini. Right. Um, so I, I, that was one aspect I liked of the book. Um, and you said you would have a, um, I guess, what would be a limited run of printing with the, the book. And so what will you do after that? Um, or maybe I misunderstood you. No, they printed they decided 350. Okay. Um, I'm thinking based on what Union Ave has sold, um, I'm thinking we're pretty near that. Mm -hmm. And they might, the press might um, do a second printing. Yeah. Um, but if they don't, then the re rights revert to me. Okay. Then I could go to um, 
you know, a big publishing house and say, hey, look, we sold this many in, you know, two states. In the middle of the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> right. In the, yeah. Um, and see, because you're right, the, um, most books are about women in their 20s making decisions with all the options are open. And, and at this point, these women have made decisions and now they're living with them. Yeah. And um, I think that there is a huge market for that because we are the book club women. We're the readers. Yeah. I don't know. Hi, Cindy. Hello. Um, I was going to ask, and if you answered this earlier, I'm sorry I got here late, but how long did the process take from the publisher says, you win, we're going to publish your novel, to now you know how much of it of your time has it taken um it's their time mostly um it was about 18 months because i got the call in november of 2018 we did all this 2019 and then it was published in 2020 so it was about 18 months it seems like a really long gestation but mine was not the only book they were publishing Mm -hmm. So, and they have contests for um, novellas, poetry, and then they just publish some books they like. So, um, I, it's, it's not unusual at all for it to take that long. And I'm guessing you had um, intense flurries of activity when you had to drop everything and work on that, and then it would go really quiet, maybe for yes. a while. Yes, they... Um, they did a copy edit, a line, line edit, copy edit. I've got them mixed up now. Anyway, they did their, you know, their edit and sent it back to me. And Cindy helped me on this because I'd read it so many times that I couldn't see what needed to be hyphenated and what didn't and where the commas went. And so she helped me another set of eyes on that. But yeah, it would be... Um, yeah, something would happen, I'd get real excited and then it would be two months and I wouldn't hear anything. And I've, I've contacted them a lot more often than they contacted me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you want me to do this? Can I do that? What if I do? Um, the main, the, one of the bigger disappointments was the um, AWP conference, the Association of Writing Programs, which is 10,000 people was scheduled to be in San Antonio and I had a plane ticket. I was so excited. And then that was supposed to be in August, in April, I think. No, it was late March. Anyway, I decided that I could not risk that, either the airplane or being with 10,000 people. So I did not go and that would have been a really excellent publicity um, opportunity. Such is life. Indeed it is. Um, and I note that the gestation period for an elephant is approximately 18 months. <clears throat> so this, this is not something that happens quickly. I'm curious as to the um, writing retreats that you mentioned. Um, you've been on a number of writing retreats. How do they differ from being in a writing group or a workshop? And uh, what is their value? Um, let me think. Rivendell was fabulous because you um, you could go there for two weeks. I think it cost fifty dollars a night or something like that, and it was no, it was just like your own monk cell. It, it was to read and write and do your own thing. There were there may have been other people there one time. I went about three different times, and one time it was just this other guy and I. We just rambled around in this big two-story house and they had grounds and trails and it was just fabulous. Now it's, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, Hedgebrook India was a workshop. Um, we each, there were, I think eight of us and we each workshopped about 20 pages each morning. And um, it was in Goa, which is a, the hippie part it was where all the sixties, Trust fund kids ended up in Goa, India. And so it was really um, a strange place. And um, we were at this hacienda kind of thing 
with different buildings. It was a residence. It was some, uh, this couple lived there. But um, early on, the monkeys knocked over the hot water tank on the roof. And so we had cold water pretty much the rest of the week. So always factor in the monkeys. Um, so it just, it just depends on where you are. Like if you're, if you're just wondering if you have a piece ready, um, one of those workshop residences is perfect. But if you, if you know you need one more swipe at it and you don't want to make a dentist appointment and you don't want anybody to bother you, you just want to hunker down, then choose one of those residences where maybe they drop meals off at your front door and there's no other interaction unless you want it. Um, there's a place called Oatmeal, Texas that you can go for three weeks if you just want to hunker down and finish, which sounds pretty good right now because I've got a hunker down project I need to start on. So I, I want to say about our um, writing group, I encourage people to join writing groups, but ours has been really special because We've had a genealogist writing her family history. We've had um, a mystery writer. We've had um, a novel, a novelist. We've had somebody that murdered somebody every chapter, every week, every month. And um, I switched from prose to plays. And so this group of five people is incredibly flexible and they read short stories too. I mean, it's whatever we bring, this group is up for it. So I, I really appreciate that because I have jumped around uh, genres quite a bit. I will second that. I think, as I said before, that these small writing groups um, and Jeanette and I and Cindy and Marilyn, we're all in the same one. Uh, they are to me at the heart of it because uh, all of us are here because we love to write and we want to improve our writing and that's to me one of the primary mechanisms that we can use and it's also very congenial and especially before this pandemic it was uh, uh, marvelous uh, to get to know people and even with the pandemic we get to communicate in this fashion and uh, critique one another's writing in a very constructive way and so it's great and it's me and four women so you know um, <laughs> I'm, I'm just loving life. Um, okay, then, are there any other questions for Jeanette or any other comments generally? Yes, I have another. <laughs> yes, Debbie. Because I, I know nothing about any of this. So how do copyrights work? Do you have to send it, get a copyright, or once somebody publishes it, then it's copyrighted? How does that work? Um, I'll, ju I'll jump in on this because yeah. I, I happen to be a law professor. Uh, but I'm not one who specializes in what we call intellectual property law. So please take what I say with a grain of salt. Um, it is, uh, that's a legal matter. And there are ways to, um, to copyright what you, um, what you write. Uh, I wouldn't worry about it too much early on. I really wouldn't. I mean, we all want our work to be ours and to protect it. But I think um, when you actually start submitting to agents or publishers, all you need to do is uh, write down you know, copyright, whatever year it is, um, by Debbie, and um, the copyright is now yours. And what if, uh, you, you, what if you do self-publishing or something? Yeah. If, if you self if you self-publish, then again, it's I think it's more or less the same process. You simply notice that it's your it's your work and that you have a copyright on it, and you move forward. Now, that's just my general impression. Um, I've done a little bit of research into this over the years. If you're very concerned about this, you can do what I did some years ago with an earlier work that I was working on and call up um, a publishing or intellectual property lawyer and spend a hundred bucks or 150 bucks um, for a, you know, a one-time consultation and simply say, um, can you tell me what I need to do to protect whatever rights I have? And I suspect that that lawyer will give you advice very similar to what I've just said. Um, it's really not that complicated and it's not something really to worry about. Jeanette, did you have something you wanted to add to that? No, I just think the book has a good chapter on that, but Laura probably knows some, um, has some opinion on that too. I can address that too. Okay, Bonnie. 
um, it, copyright attaches whenever you write something. If you write it, it's attached immediately. Um, if you want to go more serious to get it, there are ways to do that. And uh, I think you can also look at the Library of Congress, but it's, it's really not necessary, I don't think, because um, unless you're somebody like J.K. Rollins, where they're gonna come after you, they're probably, probably nobody's gonna come after you and say you've stolen their idea or steal your idea. Ideas are not copyrightable. So if you tell somebody a, a story, oh, I'm gonna write a story about this, that is not copyrightable. But the actual words that you write are. And, um, and you know, that's easy enough to prove because you've got it in your computer and you've shared it with your uh, writing group and they've seen it and they know that these belong to you. Um, I don't really think it's something you have to worry about at this point. Um, you know, long time ago, back when we all used snail mail, the big thing was you would print out your novel and put it in an envelope and mail it to yourself and not open it. So that if it ever came up, um, then you could prove that this was your, truly your book. But even that was not necessary, but that was the big thing back, I think in the eighties or maybe even some of the nineties, <laughs> sort of dating myself. I know, I'll add to what, I'll add to what Bonnie's saying there. It's really kind of unnecessary in this day and time. Uh, as she says, ideas are not copyrightable. So once you get a manuscript, then you have something that's copyright. But if you're just thinking about something, anybody can think about something. Mm -hmm. And the poor man's copyright is what she was describing where you mail it to yourself. Yeah. Even that wasn't really protection in those days. It was just to make you feel better. So, uh, I mean, you're going to, you're going to get copyright. Your, your publisher will hold your copyright for you. Once you get published, your, your publisher will take care of all that stuff for you. That's what we do. That's what a publisher is worth these days. If you're self-publishing, you have to worry about it. If you're, if you get a publisher, the publisher does it for you. So we take care of the copyright if we're publishing you. Uh, like I said, in order to get one, we have to have a manuscript and it, just an idea or talking, if you talk to somebody about an idea and then they write a story because they got inspired by what you said, I'm sorry, that's, that's not, that's not something that's copyrightable, even if they took your idea and made it into something else. So, um, it's really, it's one of those things that in the, in the, in the age of the internet, it's kind of pretty easy to prove that you wrote something. Even if you just published it on Facebook, you can say, okay, I put this post up on this date and everybody sees that this is my story. So, you know, it's, it's not a big deal in, the, in this stuff, time and age. So, uh, uh, one posting more it on the internet constitutes publishing. So if somebody says they want short stories that have never been published, don't send them one that you published on your website. You can also yeah. submit uh, the copyright office actually sub accepts online submissions. So if you're self publishing, you can go to copyright.gov and follow the process of uh, pay your, I think it's $65, uh, send your, your a physical copy and an email copy in and um, have at it. Right, um, Victoria and Kaifel have self-published. Is that right, Kaifel? Uh, we have a small press. We oh, took okay. a small press. So you have copyrighted your um, your her books, right? Yes. Um, uh, there is because of the pandemic. There is currently a seven and a half month backlog with the copyright office. <laughs> oh, jeez. Because everybody's been writing furiously, except for those who were have writer's block. So. All righty, gang. Well, I see that the witching hour is coming by. We're right up to eight o'clock. So let me uh, plug a couple of uh, KWG items before we leave. Uh, the next one that's coming up is the screenwriting and storytelling workshop on October 24th. So please go to our website. Um, we are already uh, have lots of people interested in that. And so, uh, and including me, I'm going to be going to that one. It's very it's virtual, it's online. Um, these workshops are absolutely wonderful and it's something that I highly recommend. Uh, also on November 5th, we have a program called The Life Cycle of the Book. 
with the events manager at Union Avenue Books. His name is David Shoulders. Many of you already know him. Uh, and Ashley Runyon, the director of the University Press of Kentucky. Uh, Ashley is going to bring uh, an author and a designer, a PR person, and editor for a book. Uh, this is a great extension of Jeanette's talk about getting her first novel published in the University Press. Uh, Life Cycle tells the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say. So thank you. I love Paul Harvey, by the way. By the way, um, so thanks everybody for coming. We really appreciate your being here. Uh, consider becoming a member of the Knoxville Writers Guild. Uh, look us up. It's, what is it, KWG or KnoxvilleWritersGuild.org, right? Eiffel? Yeah, I think that is I think correct. It is. Knoxville Writers Guild, all one word, dot O-R-G. I think our membership fee is a remarkable 30 bucks a year or something like that. Then you can join a writer's group and you can be, you know, a, you know, a rockin' insider like all of us. <laughs> okay. All right. So unless there's something else, I'm going to go ahead and call an end to this meeting and thank you all for coming. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks, Jeanette. Thanks, Jeanette. Thanks, Jeanette. Thanks, Jeanette. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.